Thank you very much. And that concludes general questions. And before we uh, turn now to First Minister's questions, I could invite members to join me in welcoming to our gallery Joy Birch MLA, Speaker of the Legislative Assembly of the Australian Capital Territory. Thank you. We now turn to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This week, the Education Secretary patted himself on the back and declared that more than 90% of pupils in secondary school were reaching the required standards in literacy and numeracy. Can the First Minister confirm that under the SNP's new rules, a pupil is deemed to have met those required standards of attainment, even if they fail English and maths? First Minister. Well, the statistics that were published this week, of course, were around the uh, SCQF Level 5 uh, literacy and also uh, the similar standard for numeracy. Uh, they showed uh, that more than 80% of school leavers in 2016-17 had reached that level in, uh, and 68.8% in terms of uh, numeracy. That's welcome progress, but we are determined to go further. I should say, of course, that that is not uh, the main indicator that the Scottish Government is using as a result of the uh, introduction of standardised assessment and also the new way in which uh, we are monitoring performance instead of the previous SSLN uh, survey data. We now will have data uh, on every pupil across uh, the country which will allow us uh, to determine the progress in reducing the attainment gap. Ruth Davison. That wasn't an answer to the question I asked. The question I asked was are Scottish pupils deemed to have reached the required standards of literacy and numeracy even if they fail? And the simple answer to that question is yes, because it used to be the case that we could measure literacy and numeracy standards fairly with accurate surveys. But when it turned out the rates were going down, the SNP cancelled them, and we now have a new system in place. And under that system, a pupil can fail their National 4 or their higher English and maths, but still be counted as having achieved the right standards in literacy and numeracy. In other words, you're deemed to have passed even when you've failed. Now, the First Minister keeps wanting saying that she wants to boost standards. So how does cancelling surveys, how does rigging the stats, how does lowering the bar for literacy and numeracy help achieve those higher standards? First Minister. I, I, think, I think Ruth Davidson is uh, perhaps deliberately there mixing up different stages in education. The figures that were published uh, this year, uh, this week uh, rather, were around attainment against uh, level five uh, of SCQF, both for literacy uh, and for numeracy. Uh, and what those figures show is that uh, for literacy, uh, the performance increased from 70.1% in 2013-14 uh, to 80.8% in 2016-17. Uh, and for numeracy, it went from 59.5% in 2013-14 to 688 in 2016-17. Now, uh, Ruth Davidson talks uh, about hires and level four. These uh, statistics are specifically about level five, and then, therefore, you would not compare them to performance against hires or level four. Uh, that's the first point. Um, secondly, in terms of SSLN, and this is an issue that has been discussed in this chamber on many occasions uh, previously, SSLN was a sample survey. I think I've uh, cited in the chamber before that in some schools, that survey could be based on uh, simply the performance of a dozen uh, pupils. Uh, what we have done now is ensure that we have data on all pupils across our schools. Uh, that is, of course, based on teacher judgment, but that teacher judgment is now, uh, is now assessed against and informed uh, by pupils' performance on the standardised assessment. So we're actually deepening and making much more robust uh, the measures by which uh, we measure pupil performance. So I think that is progress. And all of the statistics that were published this week show that we are making progress. And I would have thought people right across the chamber actually would have welcomed that. Yes, there's more to be done, but progress is very much going in the right direction. Ruth Davidson. The First Minister disputes the changes, but let me read from her own document published on the 20th. Standard grade courses were not unit based, so people would have to pass the course in order to achieve literacy or numeracy at their level. And now they don't. Because this isn't a system that parents can trust. It is a complete lack of rigour and it does nothing to help Scotland's children. But if we're talking about rigour, let's look at another area of school inspections. Under this government, inspections crashed to the lowest level since devolution. 
Now, I have asked the First Minister about this repeatedly in this chamber, and she said it would all get better. Yet this week we learn that some of Scotland's schools are going 16 years without being inspected, and a fifth haven't been seen for at least a decade, including one in the First Minister's constituency and two in the Education Secretary's patch. How can the First Minister defend schools going over a decade uninspected? First Minister. Well, firstly, I think Ruth Davidson probably managed to confuse herself in the first part of that last question. Uh, I was specifically talking about performance against level five literacy and numeracy. Those were the statistics published uh, this week. And I think we should welcome the fact that performance is improving. In terms of uh, school inspections, and I know Ruth Davidson will want to uh, hear the answer, uh, Education Scotland has taken action to increase the overall number of school inspections. Uh, school inspections will actually increase to 250 schools a year in the academic year 2018-19. That amounts to an increase of over 30% on the numbers of inspections taking place in this uh, academic year. Education Scotland, as I think most members uh, will be aware, gather a range of views and comments uh, on uh, behaviours and performance as part of the pre-inspection uh, questionnaires that are sent out. They're in fact right now in the process of recruiting additional inspectors uh, to support that commitment to enhanced inspection activity. So all of these things, I would have thought, presiding officer, uh, were moves that Ruth Davidson and others across this chamber would welcome. Uh, we are seeing progress in education. We are seeing progress in the right direction. Uh, we're seeing performance increasing. We are seeing the attainment gap start to narrow. There is more work to be done, but I would have hoped everybody across the chamber, and I'm sure parents uh, across the entire country, will welcome that progress. Ruth Davidson. I think we've just seen the utter complacency we've come to expect for this government when it comes to education reform. Because this is a government that deals with slipping standards by cancelling the tests that exposes them. It vows to increase inspections and has done again today, but which dropped them to the lowest historic levels and which cooks up a new measure of attainment in literacy and numeracy to try and con parents into believing that things are getting better. That won't restore Scottish education to global excellence and you won't do it by massaging the stats and then slapping yourselves on the back. When will this government face up to the challenges in Scottish education and not duck them? First Minister. Well, it is this government that's facing up to the challenges. Uh, that's why we're seeing the improvement and the progress that I have outlined. Of course, other statistics published this week show uh, record numbers of higher passes, uh, more than 150,000 higher passes, uh, even although the cohort has uh, reduced uh, for, I think, a couple of years in a row. But Ruth Davidson is just wrong in much of what she said there. Nobody is cancelling tests. What we have done is replace a sample survey uh, with comprehensive data on the performance uh, of pupils right across the country. So we've taken, we've taken uh, a survey that looks at a handful of pupils and replaced that with data on every pupil across Scotland. I would have thought Ruth Davidson uh, would actually welcome that. In terms of the statistics that she has sounded very confused on uh, today, they are... They are statistics measuring against the standards of our curriculum. And as I've also said, uh, we're increasing the number of inspections in our schools. And of course, this is the government that is investing £750 million to improve attainment. Uh, we've got the Pupil Equity Fund going direct to head teachers and head teachers and teachers I speak to across uh, the country say that that is transformational in improving standards. Ruth Davidson saying it's about standards. Yes, it's about standards and this money is helping us to improve standards. So we will continue to take the action that is about improving performance in our schools and even if Ruth Davidson and others across the chamber don't want to welcome the progress being made, I think parents across the country will welcome it. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, in January this year, I raised the serious concerns of relatives who had family members in Beald sheltered housing and care homes. On the 18th of January, the First Minister said there would be no compromise in the continuity and quality of care and that the interests of residents would be protected. Can the First Minister provide us with an update? First Minister. 
Well, as uh, Richard Leonard uh, knows, Beald uh, announced closure of eight of its 12 care homes. Uh, it announced that in October last year and said that that would happen uh, in two phases. The remaining four homes are being transferred to new owners uh, and the CHUPI process applies. Uh, all of uh, the residents from the other homes uh, have been reaccommodated uh, since early May. I understand uh, that that uh, was ahead of schedule and the Cabinet Secretary met with the Save Our Build campaigners uh, on the 6th of February. I understand Neil Finlay, uh, Joanne Lamont and Unison were present at uh, that meeting. Um, I, as I've said before, uh, know how difficult uh, this is for any residents uh, affected and for their families, but it is important when these uh, things happen, which are deeply regrettable, the government works with partners uh, to ensure that residents uh, can be reaccommodated uh, quickly. So I'm uh, very happy to ask the Health Secretary to send further information to Richard Leonard uh, if there are particular issues that he still uh, wants more information on. Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you, President Officer. One Beals resident who was forced to move was 87-year-old uh, Christina Wilson. She led an active life. She worked in Tesco's until she was 74. But at the age of 84, she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and moved into what is termed as a very sheltered flat provided by Beals in Bonnybridge. But following Beals' decision to walk away from the market, she was forced to move out into nearby Bankview Nursing Home. Sadly, Christina Wilson passed away last week. Her granddaughter, Laura Owens, told me what Christina's final weeks were like. She said, within weeks of my grand moving, despite best efforts by the new care home staff, she had stopped eating, broke her shoulder. There was a significant deterioration in her dementia. She became unable to walk, became more confused and agitated. She forgot who people were. She was tearful a lot of the time and made claims of no longer wanting to live, fundamentally giving up on life. First Minister, what does that say about what's happening in our care system? First Minister. Well, we have a good care system in this uh, country and our job as government is to work uh, with all partners and providers to ensure not only that it continues to be good but that it improves in any way that it requires to uh, improve. Uh, unfortunately the Scottish Government was not in control of the decisions uh, that Beald took however we uh, worked with Beald to ensure that residents could be reaccommodated and have been reaccommodated where any uh, former resident such as uh, Christina uh, whose case has been out by Richard Leonard today has uh, sadly died, then I would want to convey my deep condolences uh, to their loved ones. I think it was uh, Christina's granddaughter that Richard uh, Leonard was quoting there. Uh, I would be very happy to ask the Health Secretary to meet uh, with her granddaughter to discuss uh, those concerns uh, in greater depth. Uh, these are situations none of us uh, want to see happen, uh, but organisations that are independent of the Scottish Government uh, on occasion will take decisions uh, such as those we're talking about just now. Our responsibility is to work as hard as we can to ensure uh, that the impact on individuals is minimised as much as possible and that's what we did in this case and it is what we will continue to do if there are any uh, future instances like this one. Richard Leonard. Uh, presiding officer, because the dignity with which we treat our older citizens is a measure of the kind of society we are, we need to get this right and it's why Labour introduced free personal care for the elderly. For Christina Wilson, it was not necessarily that there was a compromise in the quality of care she received, but that there was a huge breach in the continuity of care that she received, and all because her care home provider walked away from the market. As a result, this woman in her late 80s, with dementia, was forced to move home. Presiding officer, I'm not sure that any of us here can really begin to feel the distress and the trauma that has been caused but we have a duty to understand it. Christina's family demands a review of the human impact of what they describe in their own words as these forced transitions, and they are right. So, First Minister, will you establish a review into what happened at Beald so that all of the wider lessons can be learned? 
First Minister. We will continue to look very carefully at all uh, of these issues and as I said in my previous answer, I will ask the Health Secretary look, uh, to look specifically at the circumstances of the very sad case that Richard Leonard is outlining uh, today and the offer to meet with uh, family members uh, stands. Uh, Richard Leonard talks about a decision that a provider took to walk away from the market and he's right about that. That was not a decision uh, of the Scottish Government and it was not a decision that the Scottish Government was able to stop build taking. The responsibility of the Scottish Government was to ensure that we worked uh, with all partners uh, to ensure that residents were reaccommodated and the disruption to individuals was minimised as much uh, as possible and that is exactly what we did and that is what we will do uh, in any future instances uh, in the regrettable uh, circumstances where they arise. Uh, we take very, very seriously our obligations uh, to continuity of care and quality of care of our older residents. Uh, Richard Leonard mentioned free personal care. This government has protected free personal care each and every year we've been in office. Of course, we are now taking steps to extend free personal care to those under uh, the age of 65 in certain circumstances. Uh, so these are important issues. They are often very, very difficult issues, but we will continue to discharge our responsibilities uh, with uh, the circumstances and the dignity and the respect that we owe to our older residents uh, very much at the top of our minds. We have some constituency supplementaries. The first from Gordon MacDonald. In my constituency of Edinburgh Pentlands, private rented property is being offered at up to £800 for a two-bedroom flat and £1,900 for a three-bed house. What is the First Minister's reaction to recent news that Edinburgh's private rent levels, including the Sight Hill area of my constituency, has some of the highest percentage yields in Scotland? and what is being done to assist tenants struggling to meet ever-increasing rent demands? First Minister. Well, I'm uh, aware of uh, a recent report by Totally Money on rental yields in Edinburgh. The new private residential tenancy that the Scottish Government introduced last year protects tenants against sudden or excessive rent increases. Uh, under uh, the new tenancy, private sector landlords can only increase rents once every 12 months and are required to give tenants three months notice of an increase uh, of uh, that. Tenants can also challenge any increase they consider unfair uh, by referring it for adjudication by a rent officer. Uh, in addition, all local authorities can now apply to ministers to cap rent increases under uh, the tenancy by designating areas uh, of particularly high rent increases as rent pressure zones. Uh, the Scottish Government has recently discussed with City of Edinburgh Council the evidence that the Council would need to provide in seeking such a designation and I know the Housing Minister would be happy to speak to Gordon MacDonald uh, to share that information with him in order that he can further assist his constituents. Thank you. Liam MacArthur. Thank you, uh, President Officer. On the eve of the Easter recess, I asked the First Minister uh, when people in Orkney and Shetland could ex expect to see the benefits of road equivalent tariff on Northern Isles ferry routes. Uh, she wasn't able to answer that question, though she did, with remarkable foresight, predict that I would be bringing it back to Parliament if not satisfied. So as we approach the summer recess and still no confirmation of a start date, can the First Minister assure my constituents that RET will be introduced on our lifeline routes as promised before the end of the first half of 2018. First Minister. Well, I know the Transport uh, Minister is currently considering the issues uh, that arise here, uh, the legal state aid issues, and uh, will uh, make uh, a further announcement in uh, due course. I, I hope that that will uh, be an announcement that is made uh, sooner rather than later, but as the member uh, will be aware, there are a number of issues uh, that the Transport Minister and the government uh, have to satisfy ourselves of before we can uh, outline uh, the detail of that announcement, but I know uh, Hamza Yousaf will keep uh, Liam MacArthur updated on progress. Mary Gujar. Last week, a story was published which claimed that Strakathro Hospital in my constituency was set to be closed and then sold off by NHS Tayside. Now, this has understandably caused a great deal of concern and distress to the staff who work there, but also to the wider community who are now in fear that this vital facility is to close. And since then, I've been inundated with correspondence about it. Now, this was raised at a meeting with NHS Tayside last week, where they gave their assurances that this was simply not the case. But can the First Minister clarify the situation in relation to Strathrow Hospital and offer her categorical, categorical assurances that this hospital will not close? First Minister. Uh, the hospital will not close uh, and the claims that it is facing closure are simply not true and I think anybody who is claiming 
uh, that is doing a real disservice to the public. Uh, the chair of NHS Tayside uh, recently met with local representatives as a result of these false claims about the future of the hospital uh, and gave MSPs and M MPs an unequivocal assurance that Stracathro Hospital yeah. is not closing. He has been explicit that NHS Tayside sees the hospital as being key to the future delivery of local health care services uh, and any suggestion to the contrary is wholly unfounded. And lastly, presiding officer, I will take this opportunity to remind uh, the chamber that was uh, this government that brought Stracathro Hospital back into the NHS after it had been privatised uh, by previous administration. John Finney. Uh, Thank you, President Officer. Uh, First Minister, I wrote yesterday to the local government minister asking that he call in um, a Highland Council uh, a decision to grant approval for a development in a triple SI, a special protected area and a Ramsar site at Cool Links. Will the First Minister confirm that in or out of the EU, the Scottish Government will respect all international treaty obligations, including the Ramsar Convention? First uh, yes, it is our intention to honour uh, obligations uh, that currently arise from uh, EU membership, uh, but we have, I think, been very clear in our resolve uh, not to see environmental protections or any other protections downgraded as a result of Brexit. So I hope that makes the position of the Scottish Government extremely clear. Question number three, Willie Rennie. Uh, the First Minister earlier on said she was making progress in education, but how can we be making progress in education with national testing for five-year-olds. Is it progress when children in Scotland say it is a detrimental waste of time? Is it progress when teachers say that time has been swallowed up and is actively harmful? Is it progress when the teaching union EIS say they are opposed to national testing for five-year-olds? I mean, even our own special advisor, Sir Harry Burns, says the government should move away from nationwide national testing. So why does she think that all of these people are wrong and only she is right? First Minister. Well, firstly, the assessments uh, are not high stakes assessment. There is no pass or fail associated with these assessments. Uh, the results are there to help teachers plan for children's progress and to inform the teacher judgment about achievement against curriculum for excellence levels. Uh, children and uh, young people's uh, interests are very much at the heart of these assessments. We look at primary one assessments in particular, they are designed around the early level of curriculum for excellence and they're compatible with play-based learning approaches in primary one. In the best practice, the assessments are experienced uh, by children as part of ongoing learning and teaching activities in the classroom. So uh, they are appropriate to the age of the child, but they are also important in making sure, to go back to the question I answered uh, from Ruth Davidson earlier on to make sure that we are replacing uh, survey data on the performance of children with comprehensive data on the performance of children which allows us to know uh, the progress we are making in closing the attainment gap. Willie Rennie. So the pupils interest you would stop these national tests right now. Older pupils are being brought in because P1s can't operate the computer because they are only five. Parents are concerned about the impact on their children because they're only five. And also the teachers have said very clearly, I've listed earlier on the list of concerns that they have got because the children are only five. But the First Minister ignores all of those concerns because all she's interested in is her computer machine with all her assessments and all her data to try and drive her forward her claim that she's going to improve the education system. So why won't she listen to all of these people who've expressed concerns? Why won't she change it and scrap the test now? First Minister. Firstly, uh, what drives me is the determination to improve standards in our schools in the interests of young people and to close the unacceptable attainment gap in our schools. And we need uh, good data uh, to assure not just ourselves, but to assure parents that we are doing exactly that. Uh, Willie Rennie says that uh, primary one pupils can't use the computers. I, I don't know about him, but I've met uh, many primary one pupils who are better at using computers than I am, uh, presiding yeah. officer. I mentioned being in a school in Largs uh, last week where young primary school children uh, were showing me 
uh, how to uh, computer code. Uh, but all of the primary one assessment questions have been designed with Education Scotland and with other educational professionals. They are aligned to the Curriculum for Excellence benchmarks for uh, primary one, which is the early level. Uh, but Willie Rennie uh, might be interested to know, uh, if he doesn't, uh, isn't aware of this already, we're conducting a user review of the first year of assessments, uh, and part of that will be listening to the experience of teachers, uh, and we will publish the user review report in August, uh, at the time of the start of the new school year, setting out any changes and enhancements that we will make to the system for next year. So we will very much listen to the views of teachers, but we will also uh, very much continue to take the action that we consider necessary to improve standards in our schools and close the attainment gap. Some further open supplementaries. The first from James Kelly. Thank you. Presiding officer, my constituent Sam Ross, who has Down syndrome, was spat at in the face by a stranger as she got the train home from her work in Glasgow. Sam has a job and she was getting the train at Queen Street just like thousands of other people. She should not have to face being spat at just to travel independently. Sam will be representing Scotland when the World Down Syndrome Congress comes to Glasgow next month, an event which will see hundreds of people with Down syndrome around the world travel to the city. Will the First Minister join with me in condemning this hate crime and will she set out what she will do to make Scotland a safe place for everyone? First Minister. Well, firstly, firstly uh, Sam should not uh, have had to face uh, that treatment. It is despicable and unacceptable. Um, and all of us uh, should be very clear uh, that behaviour of that kind uh, never will be acceptable in Scotland. And I would thank James Kelly for raising uh, Sam's experience here in the chamber today to allow me to say that uh, unequivocally. Uh, we're looking forward to welcoming uh, the Down Syndrome Congress uh, to Glasgow next month. I've uh, recorded a, a message. I think the Deputy First Minister may be speaking at uh, the Congress. And that will be an opportunity for us to celebrate uh, the amazing contribution that individuals with Down syndrome make to our society. Uh, we should and we do value them, and this is an opportunity to say that uh, loudly and uh, clearly. Uh, the police uh, will take instances like this uh, very seriously, uh, and all of us uh, must make sure that in our actions as well as in our rhetoric, uh, we are supporting that zero tolerance to any abuse or discrimination. And uh, what I would say, uh, to Sam is that she could, uh, should continue to, to work, to go uh, about her daily life and know that as she does so, uh, as uh, does anybody with Down syndrome, uh, she has the, uh, not just the full support, uh, but I'm sure the, the admiration of everybody across this chamber. Ruth Maguire. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the First Minister think it's appropriate for the UK Government to roll out the red carpet for Donald Trump, given the shocking reports of families being split up and the heartbreaking scenes of children detained and caged at the US border? And will she relay the serious concerns of the people of Scotland to the UK Government? First Minister. Well, I... I don't think it's appropriate at this time for the red carpet to be rolled out. Meetings uh, are, are perhaps one thing, uh, but red carpet treatment is another. I don't think there can be anybody, well, perhaps with the exception of Nigel Farage mm. uh, and his ilk, but I don't think there can be any uh, decent person across uh, the UK, uh, across Europe, or even uh, across the world, and the vast majority of people in America, uh, for that matter, uh, who have not been appalled at the images and the stories of young children being separated from their parents uh, and incarcerated in what look, uh, to all intents and purposes, to be cages um, in uh, America. Uh, I'm glad that uh, the President appeared uh, to U-turn on that position yesterday when he signed an executive order, although I think we've all got to be careful uh, not to just assume that the situation now is OK, because it appears to be that instead of children being detained without their parents, we will see children detained with their parents. Uh, I will continue to raise my voice uh, against uh, instances like this. And of course, it's not just in America this week that we've seen uh, reasons to be concerned. Uh, in Italy, uh, the conduct uh, around the Roma community, uh, reports today of uh, Hungary deciding to criminalise lawyers and activists who help asylum seekers should make us all pause for thought. 
Uh, we should be standing up uh, for the rights and values that all of us hold dear as human beings. Uh, the world has a collective responsibility to deal uh, with those seeking refuge and asylum. Um, and I think it's important that we do that collectively, but that we also do that uh, with human dignity at the very forefront of our minds. And that's my view, and I hope it's the view of everybody across this chamber. And Alison Johnson. In 2015, the Scottish Government asked Lord Bonamy to review the Protection of Wild Mammals Act. He did so in 2016. The Government consulted on the review in 2017, and the consultation closed in January this year, 2018. Five months on, the Scottish Government has yet to respond. Just over a year ago, the First Minister told this chamber, I have always been an opponent of fox hunting, and I remain so. Is that still the case? And if so, will the First Minister commit to legislation to introduce a real ban on fox hunting in Scotland? First Minister. Uh, I do oppose uh, fox hunting, um, and uh, that remains uh, my position. Uh, as uh, Alison Johnson rightly says, Lord Bonamy uh, looked at this in detail uh, for us. Uh, I think it's important to say he did not find evidence of widespread flouting of uh, the law, but did uh, have comments to make about the need for more clarity in the law, better enforcement uh, and uh, monitoring to deal with any illegal practices. Uh, the Environment Secretary will be making a further announcement on this uh, in due course, which will set out any further steps that the Scottish Government intends to take. Question number four, Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government has received details of the financial implications for Scotland of the UK Government's investment in the NHS. First Minister. The information that we've managed to extract from the UK Government uh, on this potential funding and its sources has been incomplete uh, at best. On Tuesday, two days after uh, the announcement, the UK Government provided a nominal profile of Barnet Consequentials, but have so far refused to confirm that this will be a net benefit to Scotland. In fact, a paper placed by the UK Government in the House of Commons Library uh, states, uh, and I quote, the final Barnet Consequentials for all three devolved administrations will be confirmed at upcoming fiscal events and at the next spending review. Uh, the Finance Secretary has requested details as a matter of urgency from the UK Government to ensure that Scotland is not shortchanged. Emma Harper. Thank, uh, thank the First Minister for that response. Has the First Minister had any guarantees at all from the Treasury that the £2 billion increase associated with the UK Government's announcement will actually be a net increase in funding to Scotland's budget, or could the money result in cuts elsewhere? Well, can I make uh, a couple of quick points? Firstly, I, I actually welcome the fact that the UK government is now talking uh, about tax rises to fund the National Health Service. It's just a, a pity that when the Scottish government did increase taxes for those who can afford to pay to fund increases for our health service, the Scottish Conservatives opposed that tooth and nail. Um, and of course, put forward tax proposals that would have taken £550 million out of the Scottish budget equivalent to 12,000 nurses. Uh, secondly, we don't yet know that any uh, consequentials will represent a net increase. We have some experience here. Uh, for example, when there was the promise of consequentials uh, last year of £33 million from winter funding, uh, we ended up receiving just £8.4 million of that because of the way uh, that commitment was funded. The fact of the matter is, until we know from the UK government how they intend to fund this commitment, yep. we do not know how much there will be for the Scottish Government in consequentials. We do know, for example, none of this money will come from a Brexit dividend because there is no such thing yeah. as a Brexit yeah. dividend. But until we know where it will come from and that it doesn't involve cuts in other devolved areas, then we will not know the final amount. So the sooner we get that information, uh, the better, presiding officer, uh, and we will continue to press the UK government for it. Miles Briggs. Thank you. Thank you, President Officer. The First Minister is known for never wanting to seek grievance and division between England and Scotland, but a key aspect of what the First Minister has not mentioned today is the fact that under the Conservatives in England, health spending has grown twice of that of Scotland. And does the First Minister not accept that since 2010, her government's received £2.46 billion in additional Barnet consequential funding for our health service? So as we celebrate the NHS turning 70, can she not find it in her heart to actually welcome this additional funding. First Minister. When, 
when we know what the additional funding is, uh, and if it does amount to the kind of sums uh, that have been talked about, then of course we will welcome it. But we do not know that right now. And I will repeat again, uh, when we were previously promised 33 million, uh, when we saw the detail of that, it turned into 8.4 million. So forgive me, I think I'll wait to see the colour uh, of the money first. But in terms of comparisons between Scotland and England, I'm not sure if Miles Briggs is aware of this, but health spending in Scotland is £163 per person higher than it is in England. That's 8% higher per head. In fact, he wants his... Miles Brigg wants us to match the English levels of health spending. Well, we'll if we were to match uh, the levels of uh, per head health spending in England, we would have to take £880 million out of the oh, NHS budget. That would be the price of matching spending in England. So if Miles Briggs doesn't mind, uh, we will continue to fund the health service fairly in Scotland. And we will continue to do it by being honest with people uh, about the modest tax rises instead of pretending like the Tories do that there's some mythical unicorn of a Brexit dividend. Question number five, Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you, presiding officer. <laughs> Let's hope this will go better then. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the recent report by ISD Scotland, which suggests that antidepressants are detected in nearly half of post-mortems involving accidental drug deaths. First Minister. Well, the recent report uh, was extremely helpful in allowing us to deepen our understanding of this issue because it's important that our action is not only driven by what drugs are detected uh, in those uh, who die from drug misuse, but importantly, that our actions are also informed by where a drug is assessed as being implicated in a death. Uh, this week, ISD analysis showed antidepressants were implicated in combination with other substances in 10% of accidental drug-related deaths. However, they were implicated uh, in combination with other substances in 43% of intentional drug-related deaths. This analysis of already published data reinforces that large numbers of those who are most at risk often suffer from poor mental health. Uh, we're working already to develop better dual diagnosis service arrangements for those suffering from substance misuse and mental health problems because we know that the use of antidepressants alongside uh, the use of opioids can bring additional risks. Michelle Ballantyne. I thank the First Minister for that answer. But is it, isn't it that the right place to consider the difficult and nuanced question of how prescription drugs and illegal drugs are linked is the Scottish Government's overall strategic approach to drugs? However, it's now almost a year since the Scottish Government promised a refresh of its drug strategy, and I can't find any sign of when it's coming. So can the First Minister give us a guarantee that the refresh strategy will be published before we come back from summer recess? First Minister. Uh, the forthcoming substance uh, use strategy uh, will be published shortly. Um, I'll ask the Health Secretary uh, to write to the member when the date for that is known. Um, that strategy will look at how services can adapt to find uh, people most in need and then deliver services that address their specific uh, circumstances. We've been very clear uh, that behaviours and culture around substance misuse uh, have changed and that services uh, we think are not currently meeting the wide range of very complex health and social care needs of those uh, most at risk. That's why it's been right to take time to develop this strategy, uh, but I hope when it is published, uh, the member will engage with it and indeed hopefully be able to welcome it. Question number six, Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the National Audit Office report ruling out universal credit. First Minister. Uh, the National Audit Office report provides further evidence that the UK Government's shambolic universal credit is failing people, causing debt, rent arrears and hardship across Scotland and the UK as a whole. The report states that there is uh, no evidence that universal credit will provide value for money to the taxpayer or achieve its targets in relation to getting people back into work. Of particular concern is the finding that the DWP is showing, uh, and I quote, a lack of regard in failing to understand the hardship faced by some claimants. Uh, that, in my view, is damning and even further evidence of what the Scottish Government, alongside many others, has long and repeatedly called for, uh, a halt to the rollout of universal credit so that fundamental flaws with the system can be fixed. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Communities has written yet again to Esther McVeigh urging the UK Government to do just that. Mark Griffin. I'm grateful for the First Minister's response because we agree 
uh, universal credit must be halted and must be fixed. Nine and a half thousand families with children in my region are suffering the misery and destitution that universal credit that the Tories are willfully forcing on communities. Now, the Scottish Government have announced plans for an income supplement through the social security system and we proposed a child benefit top up because it future proofed against means testing, conditionality, sanctions and the destitution of universal credit. The First Minister, you can't deliver dignity and respect using universal credit. Will you today rule out using universal credit for your planned income supplement? First Minister. We are considering all options uh, for the income supplement. We want to do that in the way that is best for those who would be in receipt of that. Angela Constance set out uh, our current thinking around that when the child poverty strategy was published uh, and we will continue to inform Parliament as our thinking on that develops. Uh, we see that as a, a very important part of our efforts to reduce child poverty in particular. Um, of course, we are also taking other action, mitigating some of the welfare cuts we're seeing coming from Westminster and uh, of course, from next summer, we will see the introduction of the Best Start grant, which uh, will give additional financial help uh, to new parents uh, in, in low-income families when a child is born. So we will continue to take action across uh, a range of areas to make sure that we're helping those who most need our help. But I hope all of us, uh, certainly uh, in Mark Griffin's party and uh, in the government, uh, will join together uh, to call for a halt to universal credit, because uh, even using our devolved powers, 85% of the welfare budget and, and powers still lie with Westminster. I hope that one day soon we see all of these powers lying with this parliament, but until that day comes, uh, I think it is incumbent on all of us to call on the UK government to stop policies that we know are doing so much harm to so many people across the country. Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Social Security Committee regularly hears evidence of the devastation that the rollout of universal credit causes, pushing people into debt and rent arrears. Considering the strikingly different approach that Scotland is taking to Social Security from that of the UK Government, does the First Minister believe with me, believe like me, that the only way to ensure fairness, respect and dignity is for all Social Security powers to be devolved to this Parliament? First Minister. Uh, yes, I believe that the sooner that happens, the better. And I, I hope we can get uh, Labour support for that now in a way that we didn't have uh, previously. I think we have the opportunity to show. I think we are already showing uh, where we have powers that we can do things differently and better uh, and do things in a way that uh, makes sure that fairness, respect and dignity are very much at the heart of all of our policies. So the more we demonstrate that through the use of our limited powers over Social Security, the more I think uh, the argument for having total devolution of Social Security simply becomes uh, completely overwhelming and I hope we see that happen very soon. Question number seven, Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to support the Joe Cox Foundation initiative, The Great Get Together. First Minister. Well, I'm delighted to say that the Government uh, is supporting this year's uh, Great Get Together, which of course follows the success of last year's events. Uh, I was able to offer uh, both my support and encouragement to Joe Cox's sister, Kim Ledbetter, when I had the opportunity to meet her in May. This year's events will take place this weekend, uh, which would, of course, have been Joe's birthday. Uh, and I'm pleased to see that a number of events will take place at uh, the length and breadth of Scotland. Monica Lennon. I thank the First Minister for her response and for her continued support for the Joe Cox Foundation. When Kim Ledbetter, Joe's sister, um, was in Parliament recently, she said that Jo would want to be remembered for how she lived and not for how she died. Jo's legacy has taught us that being kind and compassionate does not make politicians or communities weak. That's what made her strong. This weekend, in, in tribute to, to Jo uh, and what would have been her birthday, people right across the UK will come together to celebrate our diverse communities and to demonstrate that just as Jo once said, we are far more united and have far more in common than that which divides us. So will the First Minister join me in encouraging people to take part in these great get-together events happening across Scotland, where they will be warmly welcomed, including at the coffee morning I'm hosting in Hamilton on Saturday. And does she agree with me that our communities will be strengthened if we all endeavour to love like Joe? First Minister. Uh, yes, I agree with that. Uh, I would encourage people to take part in events in their own communities over uh, the weekend. Um, I do think uh, they help to 
bring people together and for all our uh, divides, for all our disagreements, and uh, that is natural and necessary in any vibrant democracy. I, I would like to think that all of us work hard. We might not always succeed, but all of us work hard to ensure that kindness and compassion is very much the hallmark of how we do and approach politics. Um, I didn't know Jo Colt personally. I, I wish I had had the opportunity to know her, but everything I uh, have read and heard about her says she was a, a passionate, vibrant, energetic individual who put those uh, principles and values into practice. And I have to say those values uh, were very much evident in her sister when I met her uh, a few weeks ago. So this is an opportunity. There are many issues, perhaps uh, more so now than has been the case in recent times in our politics that cause deep disagreement. And we've talked about some of them today and no doubt will continue to do so. Uh, but at the end of the day, it is useful always to remind ourselves, and uh, I think Joe's memory helps us do that, uh, that there is always more that unites us as human beings than will ever divide us as politicians. So this is a good opportunity this weekend just to remember that and encourage everybody uh, to take part in these events very much in that spirit. Thank you very much. And that concludes First Minister questions. We will move on to members' business shortly. In the name of Christina McKelvey, uh, there'll be a on MND Awareness Week 2018. Uh, we'll just take a short suspension before then to allow the public gallery to clear and for our new guests to arrive. So a short suspension.